Thank you for the invitation to share my thoughts uh, on the topic of uh, investing for impact, because at least in the global conversations in which I sit here as a business school professor at INSEAD, this is becoming a very important topic, which is historically making a positive difference to society has been seen as something that is in the field of philanthropy, but more and more investors are seeming to uh, get interested on this topic. So the thought that I'm sharing today, uh, these come uh, to a large extent, they are a summary of some of the things that I talk about in my courses at INSEAD, for example, in the MBA and EMBA program. Now there's a very popular course called Strategy and Investing for Impact. And then I also annually run a program called India, sorry, INSEAD Social Entrepreneurship Program in which in We've actually had some excellent social sector uh, participants from India as well in the past. And so I'm going to talk about some of the discussions we have with a focus on the investing side, because that's the topic uh, for today. So the starting point is the observation that, you know, if you pick up any newspaper globally, especially business magazines, business newspapers, there's this conversation that impact is going mainstream, right? So this is no longer a niche topic that only social sector people are talking about. BlackRock, which is one of the largest uh, investing fund in the world is, has been telling people, okay, we now want to invest only in companies which have a clear sense of purpose. Similarly, UBS, which is large, one of the largest banks in the world is telling its clients when you invest, you should invest not just looking at the financial returns, but also keeping in mind what, are, what is the environmental, social, and governance uh, performance of the portfolio you're investing in. And all of this is being done not with a view of doing favor to anybody, but with a view that this actually is the right way even for making money in the long run. And certainly, you know, uh, you can see where these trends are coming from, especially in Europe now, there's almost a shame attached to taking flights because of the carbon footprint of flights. Large consulting firms are really scaling back on, uh, on flying for, uh, for the same reason that it has significant environmental uh, costs. Regulators are increasingly trying to come up with the correct frameworks in which all the externalities businesses are imposing will be priced in and going forward, we can certainly see more and more of that happening. So a lot of what is happening in the business world is a response to that. And so if you now look at some of the successful companies today, and this was being mentioned in an earlier panel as well, uh, topics like electric vehicles, it turns out that today, Tesla actually is a far more valuable company than Toyota. So in terms of its market capitalization, Tesla is today the largest company in the world, even though its profits are uh, relatively minuscule or very often negative. But the point again is that if you look to the future of investing, future of business, there's a view that this is the only way to run business. And the biggest opportunities will be the ones that take into account the environmental costs and the social costs and impacts that businesses are imposing. If you uh, might have seen uh, Al Gore's uh, documentary An Inconvenient Truth that came many years ago, which started a lot of the global conversations around climate change, Al Gore actually says sustainability is history's biggest investment opportunity. And uh, he's the co-founders of a UK-based fund called Generation investment, which has 20 billion assets under management, whose whole point of view is that through active management of a portfolio, ensuring that the environmental performance is up to the mark and more recently social performance is up to the mark, you can actually make good returns in the long term as well. And uh, one of their earliest uh, investments was a company called MCOPA in Eastern Kenya, which essentially brings access to energy to uh, rural areas in sub-Saharan Africa 
through a pay-as-you-go model, recognizing that there is more and more mobile penetration and through a business model that's enabled by payments that happen through these mobile uh, phones, they, they brought uh, access to energy through, you know, essentially a leasing solution for household uh, solar lighting systems. And, you know, it, it scaled up to be a profitable company. So in generation was one of the early investments or certainly early investments during the scale up part of uh, this company, again, with a view that there's significant social impact in bringing access to energy to villages that might not have had electricity before at the same time as potentially a business opportunity. So more recently, they've launched a fund called the Sustainable uh, Solutions Fund 3, which has these three broad buckets, the investments in, in health uh, of people, investments in health of the planet, and, and the third is financial inclusion. So they have very specific areas in which they're investing, again, looking explicitly for opportunities where they feel that they can make a significant positive difference. For example, in aligning with the sustainable development goals. And at the same time, it is a very viable business opportunity. So these examples illustrate this broader point that the conversation that you know very often we have and certainly used to have about this is my portfolio, this is how I make money, and this is philanthropy, this is how I give my money away. Those conversations are coming together and people are saying, well, I have a certain amount of money, part of which you know, I'm happy to give away, part of it I want to be investment for myself, for my family. How do I bring those together in one single portfolio? And the point of view would no longer be, I just consider the impact from philanthropy and making money from investing, but I bring it all together and I say, what is my overall impact and what are my overall financial returns? And this way of thinking brings up new opportunities, both uh, for the person investing to have a portfolio that has a bigger impact and better returns on the whole, at the same time as opening up new sources of funding potentially for organizations, including social enterprises and mainstream businesses, which are trying to bring business models that also have significant societal impact. So what I'm going to talk about today, uh, I'm significant part of time, I'll be talking about what is called impact investing, which in a way is right at the intersection of the two. But I also want to briefly acknowledge two other buckets here uh, in the investing spectrum, as I call it, which is it's a spectrum where on the right side of the spectrum are the organizations that are that believe in free markets. On the left side of the spectrum are organizations that are purely in philanthropy mode, funding charities, not relying on markets and businesses at all. But in between, you have these three kinds of lenses of investing, which take into account both your societal impact as well as the returns. And what's different among them is the extent to which they're focusing and prioritizing intentional impact, right? So if you are a venture philanthropy, then you're saying, okay, I'm happy to lose some money, but business models and investing in business models is sometimes still the right way of, or, or the better way of spending my money than giving it away purely as grants. And I'll talk about that briefly at the end. On the right-hand side is the sustainable and responsible investing. And this is where uh, what BlackRock or, or Credit Suisse or UBS are talking about. A lot of it will fall in this bucket, which is saying we are still to a large extent investing in large public companies, but we brought in this extra layer of are these companies also deliberately trying to reduce their environmental damage and improve their social performance. And in between is this intersection, which is uh, impact investing. And that's something that I will be spending a little bit of uh, time on now. So just to be clear on uh, uh, the definition of impact investing to start with. So in impact investing, um, according to Jin, is uh, involves investments that are made in companies, 
organizations or funds with the intention to simultaneously generate impact and financial returns. So both sides of the coin are equally important to impact investing. So if you break it down into really the defining characteristics which differentiate impact investing from sustainable investing, right? Which is what I talked about earlier. There are there is this focus, much stronger focus than in sustainable investing on, yes, there are, there's an expectation of return, but there is a much more intentionality to make a positive difference, to solve a societal problem, to fill a really neglected but important need in society, right? And this is not just about having the intentionality. The intentionality then leads to having a very explicit impact strategy or a theory of change. So it's normally unusual for a business to have a theory of change for having impact. But if you are in this bucket of impact investing, that would almost be an expectation that not only are you clear in your business model on how you make money, but you're also clear on your impact model or theory of change on how do you bring about the positive change you're seeking. And then you actually follow it up by actual impact management, which very often would involve some degree of actually going and measuring and reporting periodically, not just on your financial performance, but also on your social and environmental performance. So the important thing again to emphasize here is that impact investing would do everything that sustainable investing does, which is it still you know, tries to reduce its negative impacts, it still tries to have inclusion, it, it's trying to deal with issues of, for example, uh, inclusion on the gender dimension, um, not having trafficking in the supply chains, having appropriate labor conditions and all of that. That's taken as a given, but it goes further than sustainable investing to saying, I have very specific goals, just like a social sector organization would have on what is my issue on, mission on the impact dimension and how do I actually deliver on it by having a very clear impact strategy and then I impact management process, which is layered on top of my financial performance process. So you can see why at the same time as you know, it, it's extremely promising. It's also complex because in a way it's trying to do both what a social sector organization would do and a business would, uh, would do. And it's trying to say, do all of this while saying we are actually going to make money. And this is the expectations uh, of returns question here. And uh, where you know the ideologies differ a little bit is there are some in impact investors that say, hey, we are doing impact. It's hard to do impact. So yes, we are trying to make some financial returns, but we will not be able to give you as much financial return as what a traditional business would get. On the other hand, there are other impact investors who say, actually, these are fantastic and underexplored business opportunities. So we are going to have the impact, but we are going to have the impact while also giving you at least as much financial return as you would normally get if you had a, another portfolio which was bearing the same amount of financial risk. So there's a little bit of a tug of war which has been going on for years and it continues to go on till, till this day in this field. So, just to get a sense uh, on you know, what you think about this issue, let me pose a poll question to you here. You know, so I just talked about these two ideologies. Ideology A is what is the concessionary uh, impact investing, which is saying you know, impact investing has to accept some financial compromise. And then an alternative view of the world is the non-concessionary view, which is saying, you know, impact investing should not be accepting financial compromises because in the end it is investing. And I'm just wondering what you think about that. So I can see that in the results, about two thirds of the people um, say that we should be willing to take compromises and one third say we should not. I'm wondering, uh, if it's, uh, Ridula, if it's possible to enable the chat, I'm just curious on why people are voting one way or the other. It would be interesting to see just a few points of view. If you could, uh, if everybody could just, you know, 
put in chat your your just quick reaction on why do you think you you voted for concessionary on or non concessionary the chat has been enabled yeah sure thank you so sonam thinks it should be non concessionary because for good reason which is it would encourage more investments so uh, it should be non concessionary because if it's non concessionary naturally more people would be willing to put money in any different points of view on this okay so see if you don't mind when you reply before that write a or b so that we know what you voted and i am assuming that um uh, siddhi you have voted a which is if you are primarily about creating impact then you should be willing to accept compromises but i could be wrong so my issuer a is an investment not a charity in some fields like education the returns if any are much longer so again samir and sita have different points of view smita is saying if impact is in the center we need to uh we need to accept compromises maybe a couple of other comments so nitish is saying a vivek is saying yeah I, why would you even bother with impact investing concessionary so you know these are very good arguments we see on both sides and that these arguments that you are putting in the chat do indeed uh, reflect the exact arguments people say people that are going in bucket a are saying well if you're not concessionary why do we even need something called impact investing why wouldn't normal investors do it if it's just a, a business opportunity and uh, and people in bucket b say well if it really is such a big opportunity then there should be money to be made if we are trying to go beyond philanthropy and unlock additional capital which would normally have gone to other kind of funds then we have to be uh, non concessionary as much as possible because otherwise we are not going to unlock uh, capital and in particular here one of the biggest debates has been on the largest pools of money are sitting actually in what are called institutional investors which are like pension funds insurance funds and uh, historically impact investing has really struggled to attract those and they have normally much bigger pools of money but because of their view of their fiduciary duty um they are not willing to take compromises so for example think from the point of view of a pension fund they are saying you know if ordinary middle class people are putting money in the fund to save for their old age we do not have a right to take that money and put it in something that's going to lose money at the same time if we can find good opportunities where we are not going to lose money uh we would do it and so practically in some of the surveys for example surveys that have been run uh by uh jin it turns out that the split is actually somewhat of in the opposite direction from what we are seeing today so among the people that are in web in this webinar uh two thirds are willing to take compromises and one thirds are are not um not surprisingly because you know we are in a uh, earthen uh, social impact uh, webinar but if you look at impact investors two thirds of them actually would expect uh, uh, uh or or target close to market returns and only one third would be willing to take compromises and even within that half would take some compromises and the other half would would uh really uh take significant compromises while still preserving capital and this is important normally in the definition of impact investing if you lose money if you don't even preserve capital then you're no longer in the impact investing space then you are in the venture philanthropy space because you're putting money in knowing that not all of it is coming back and this is just a matter of terminology that sometimes gets confusing so it's important to know so in other words just to recap within impact investing here two se segments one is the non concessionary which is competing with mainstream investments and giving you market returns the other is non concessionary which is saying we will give we will take some hit but we'll still try to preserve principle and give you some returns and then once you start to lose money 
then you're no longer in the impact investing space. Then you're in the venture philanthropy space. But your point of view is sometimes it's still a good idea to invest rather than just give the money away. Because let's say even if you give half, get half the money back, this means you can actually support two projects with the same amount of money that would normally have gone into uh, one project. The other thing, you know, practically just to uh, see is how, how can we really uh, think of a scenario in which you're having impact at the same time as you're delivering market returns? So here's a example of an investment that I've, I've studied. It's an edtech platform uh, called Ruanguru in Indonesia, uh, which is about bringing more inclusive access to, uh, you know, think of it as after school help or even tuition or test preparation through a very cheap platform, uh, uh, online platform. So the idea is normally people who live in villages or in low income segments who either didn't have access to tuition centers or test preparation to get into colleges or couldn't afford to uh, get tutors. Now can, you know, part of it, and it's a freemium model. Some of them could, you know, do some free exercises. Some can pay a couple of dollars a month and use that to prepare for their test. So, so think of the equivalent of medical entrance or engineering entrance kind of uh, exams in India. And rather than having to go to expensive tutors, you have online help for that. And this particular venture, which not surprisingly has done particularly well during COVID times because uh, technology really has uh, enabled learning from home in this case, this venture has data, even though it's self-reported, both on financial returns, which have been excellent, but also on its impact in terms of at least as per their internal impact assessments, people coming on their platform have three, three times as much chance of getting into college than people who were not on their platform. So at least people that defend the non-concessionary approach, they would give you uh, examples like this. Practically, has impact investing made money? Um, and the answer is, yeah, reasonably. I mean, it's not like it has completely uh, uh, beaten the normal uh, kind of investing. But if you look at returns, and in global terms, I think these are in US dollar terms, both in terms of debt and equity, these returns are pretty good. I mean, in, in, in debt terms, they are in the 7 to 10% range. In equity, they are between 10 and 20%. Uh, IRR range, which is uh, not bad at all if you really are also at the same time delivering on impact. So a lot of people take this as evidence of, look, impact investing works. You can have impact and you can deliver uh, good returns. At the same time, you know, others such as uh, this Oxfam report raise concerns of the kinds that some of you have raised in, in the chat saying, well, if impact in investing is making money, that in itself is not enough evidence that you, you're actually delivering on what you promised because, hey, what about the impact? Because the reality is most organizations are much more stringent on how they uh, manage and report their financials than what they do on the side of, of impact. And so the concerns from uh, the likes of Oxfam have been, you know, what the impact led enterprises, especially the enterprises that really need the money and are not capable of delivering market returns. What they need is more patient capital at you know, cheaper rates, while what a lot of the impact investors are delivering is more aggressive capital that still expects market returns. So yes, they are saying we are delivering market returns, but in the process, they're excluding the social impact uh, enterprises that would potentially be most most impactful. So that debate is still goes on to, to, to this day. And, you know, if you really want to uh, get to that, then we have to go back to the basic question on what is impact in the first place, because that's, that's, that's where the debate arises. Different people are reporting uh, impact in different ways. Some people are saying, hey, you know, I reach 100,000 farmers. I serve a million women. Surely that's impact. While others are saying, but, you know, how much difference are you making in their lives? And so this goes back to first principles of impact. And if you really look at it from uh, an academic point of view, we would say impact is ultimately about imagining a world 
in which you're running your project, your program, your organization versus one in which you're not. And that delta is the impact. And so certainly scale is one dimension of it, but the other dimension of it is, is the depth of, of impact. And the important thing is different organizations are different, right? So there would certainly be opportunities out there where you can build a business model that makes a lot of money, reaches a lot of people. And that would be the case of there's huge scale of impact. But very often, though not necessarily always, that scale is going hand in hand with the depth of impact. That's not as much as there would be if you had a social enterprise deeply embedded in the community, working with just 500 people, and your cost structure therefore is more expensive and you're not targeting market returns, but you really are seeking to make a big, big difference in the lives of the 500 people or the 1000 people you serve. And so it's important to bear in mind that it should not be seen as a horse race. These are just different kinds of enterprises. Both of these enterprises are important and useful to society. And perhaps the right kind of funder for those two kinds of enterprises is naturally going to be different. One of them requires perhaps financial compromise and the other one, especially once taking the long-term perspective is able to deliver financial returns. And this is a good point also to highlight the third dimension of impact, which is to say, hey, if I put $50 million down today, how much impact do I have? And if you're comparing philanthropy lens with investing lens, a philanthropy lens would say, I'm able to make so much difference, let's say for this year, but next year I need the money again. And the year after I need the money again. While uh, investing lens would say, if I can with the same amount of money enable a business model that is going to make it a one-time investment so that once the money goes in now, it's going to support the impact for the next five, 10, 20 years without having further money uh, needed. Certainly not in a concessionary form. Then potentially, an investing lens is better than a philanthropic lens. Importantly, that goes back to asking the question, are you really going to take a compromise if you switch from philanthropy to investing? And sometimes again, the answer can be yes, because what might have happened is if you went from a philanthropy lens to an investing lens, you might have excluded the poorest segments in, in uh, your population you might no longer be providing healthcare to the poorest people, or you might not be giving loans to the poorest people or access to finance to the poorest people because you don't see them as profitable enough. And certainly not if your investor is expecting market returns. So again, there is a bit of tension that comes. And so that's why it's important not to think of whether approach A is better than approach B. These are just different things. You might be able to have some models that make a lot more impact at scale that lasts a long time in serving segments for which a business model is viable. But there might be other segments on which, in which a business model might not be as viable. Or even if it's viable, it's at least not as profitable. And so these are, again, two different paths to having impact rather than thinking A is better than B. It is about different problems different tools. And, and that really is uh, the mindset with which the leading players in this space are approaching the issue. So one of the challenges, of course, going back to the Oxfam critique about impact is to say, okay, can we start having a little bit of an agreement across the impact investing ecosystem on what is impact and how are we going to hold ourselves responsible for it? So for example, one of the things that IFC had proposed one or two years ago uh, through their impact investing standards was this very structured approach in which as you go through the investing life cycle, if you will, just like normal investors, let's say private equity would have steps in which they would go through uh, being very clear on what is their intent how are they going to do the sourcing? How do they do due diligence? And how do they do follow up and ultimately exit? Keeping in mind financials throughout, you similarly have to embed impact in the entire process right from the beginning to the end while having a very clear uh, definition of what is impact to you? What is your impact mission? And then backing it up with measurement that shows you're delivering on that mission. And uh, very importantly, as uh, in this uh, slide, the picture shows 
it should ideally be backed with independent ver verification, which is currently mostly lacking in the impact investing space. But if, if you really want to be credible, then just like for your financial statements, everybody would expect that there's an auditor who's auditing it. Similarly, even on your impact numbers, irrespective of whether you're focusing on breadth, depth, duration, uh, or, or, or whatever, the important thing is, is there independent verification or do we have to just take your word for it? Because if we have to take your word for it, not surprisingly, it's, it's less credible. The other framework more broadly, not just in impact investing, but that's, uh, that's also uh, coming for managing, managing impact in general is this impact management framework where you know, these five questions are worth uh, going back to saying anytime you're an impact enterprise and you're claiming to have impact, you have to be clear, not just about one number, but about five things. The first is the what, you know, what are the outcomes that you're seeking? The second is the who, who are you serving? In this case, if you're a microfinance organization, you know, are you clear on the segment of women you're serving? Would they have access to loans will, from other organizations or would they not, right? Are they poor, are they not? Do they have bank accounts? Do they have, they don't have bank accounts. Are they financially literate, are they not, right? Because that's an important thing to be very clear about. And then the third question is how much, you know, what really is happening to the outcomes? Focusing not on how much are you spending, but what's happening on the outcome side, which is are more women becoming entrepreneurs? Are more businesses being formed? Is their is their incomes going up? And then the next point is the contribution. Is it really happening because of us, right? We might have been in a location for two years and we've seen the incomes of women go up over time. But maybe it was because the government policy uh, has also changed in the meantime, or economic growth is happening, or the economy is booming. How is it that you're making a difference as an enterprise? And then as an investor, for the enterprise, are you the only investor or does the enterprise have access to multiple investors? And that determines how much real difference you're making. And the last is of course the risks, which is it's very easy to tell an impact story, but just like in a business model, a lot can go wrong. So are you clear about what could go wrong? And very importantly, are you ending up having any unintended consequences that you know you normally don't keep track of, but you should be keeping track of because you have to take into account and the story you should be telling is not the story of your intended impact, but the net impact, which is how much is the real positive impact have that you're doing and how much unintended consequences uh, come up. For example, are some people ending up in extreme debt and, you know, to go to the really extreme end, you know, like what happened in Andhra Pradesh in 2020, are there cases where people are ending up even, even committing suicide or pressuring uh, people uh, to take extreme steps just to be able to pay back their, their loans. So the last thing I want to uh, talk about a little bit, having talked about impact investing is going back to the point about impact investing is not going to solve everything, right? So impact investing sits in the sweet spot where depending on whether you're non-concessionary or concessionary, either you're giving market returns or at least some returns, but we are pre preserving your principle. So what that really means is impact investing normally is not going to go fund you if you are an early stage enterprise, which is still figuring out your business model. You don't have proven cash flows. The model still looks risky from the point of view of uh, investment. And this is where very often you would say, okay, the right person to go for me, yes, might be grants, but after grants, rather than jumping directly to impact investing, I need to go look for somebody who's willing to perhaps give me loans at cheap rates and so on, and is willing to bet on me and is willing to bet on me, not because uh, they expect to make a lot of money, but they're willing to bet on me because they expect that, that the support they give me will help me develop as an impact enterprise to really uh, have an impact that they'll be proud of, right? So very often that's why venture philanthropy also comes from impact first organizations. Many of them are foundations. One of the examples is Root Capital, uh, which invests in community-based uh, organizations that are, for example, aggregators 
for 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 farmers and connecting them to markets and, and so on. Another example is Gates Foundation. Uh, uh, in its early stages, uh, invested in a in an organization called V Cash in uh, Bangladesh, which was a financial inclusion platform that subsequently grew to uh, become quite big. But in the stages in which uh, Gates invested in it, they were essentially saying, "We've been investing millions of dollars as grants into this organization anyway, but we want to help this organization become investment ready for more mainstream impact investment." Investors. And the way we would do it is we would give them money. The money is set up as a series A equity. But in our books, we are actually going to write away, write, it, write off 50% of it. Because we know that we are taking a huge risk on it. And in a way, the valuation is not what a valuation uh, a, a mainstream venture capitalist would put on it. But that's all right, because we want to help them transition. And we are at a point where rather than giving them pure grants, helping them transition to an uh, investment way of thinking would ultimately help them get uh, more mainstream funding. So in a way, venture philanthropy becomes the bridge between philanthropy and impact investing. And then impact investing itself becomes a bridge to take them further to perhaps at least a subset of them further to a more mainstream investor, which might not have any impact lens at all. So. The thing I should again re-emphasize, as I said earlier, was I think it's not that concessionary or non-concessionary approach is the right way. They're just different ways. And sometimes we see some funds which are simultaneously using both. Uh, so for example, Bridges has a set of funds which it called social sector funds, which is deliberately investing in social enterprises, which are cross-subsidy models, and they're not promising you market returns. At the same time, they have another set of funds, which they call sustainable growth funds, which are funds which have a mandate of having impact, but at the same time delivering market returns. And so th that fund would invest in a different kind of business. In this case, they invested in a, a chain of low cost gyms in uh, low income areas uh, all over London and, uh, and outside with a view that it will help improve health outcomes. Right. So the idea again is to find the right tool for the right problem rather than ideologically get stuck in is this way right or, or, or that that way right. So similarly, Omidyar is another organization which said we are going to look even further uh, uh, down the spectrum. So we are going to actually rather than have two, we are going to have these three buckets. One bucket is saying this should be able to give us commercial returns. And you know, if it gives us commercial returns, we just have more money that we can then pump into other um, higher impact projects. Here is something that will not give us commercial returns. So it's a concessionary capital, but it will give us some returns, right? And this is what is the category B in this diagram. And then certain problems are so tough that there's no way to tackle them uh, without having grants. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put them in the grants bucket, but I expect that the kind of impact they generate in terms of perhaps systems change or correct, completely creating ecosystems or markets, that impact has to be much bigger. So again, the right tool for the right problem, but normally the more concession you accept, there's an the expectation that the nature of impact itself deepens or it to be justified for you as an investor to take take on uh, that investments, because as an investor, you care both about the money that's coming in and the impact you're generating. And you care about the money, not just to make yourself rich. It's just that if more money comes back, there's more for you to then fund future programs and enterprises. So I want to just close with a few uh, you know, bigger thoughts. One is one of the challenges and critiques, of course, from the lens, uh, investing lens, and especially if it's done with a non-concessionary approach, is, is very often it is like staying near the surface of an iceberg, which is you see problems, you fix it, you go after specific narrow problems, which are well-defined and for which the impact is cleanly identified and there's a clear business case. But if you're looking at systems wide chain, that seems hard, expensive, you're not going to be able to do it on your own, right? So at a minimum, then if you're an impact investor, you would be engaged in broader collaborations, which are starting to happen, for example, between governments, 
impact investors and philanthropists to say, let's tackle this bigger problem and break it up into pieces and then find the right tools for each of those pieces. The other thing um, I would say is, and this, this is an issue that I've been thinking a lot about over the past year, is this notion of justice, which is very often when we are in the impact space or even in philanthropy space, for example, there is this sense that we are doing somebody a favor by quote unquote helping them. And the justice lens, which comes of course from ethics and philosophy is about saying, we also have to recognize that a lot of the money that we make right in society as a business person, as an investor or where we get in life. So for example, I managed to get a good education which helped me ultimately become a professor, get a reasonably well-paid job and having the opportunity to talk to you today, right? I recognize that not all of this is somehow my innate ability. There were a lot of enabling conditions in the society that helped me get where I am. And also a lot of it was luck. And so once you recognize that, then the perspective changes. You're not trying to help others. You're trying to engage in this space because that's just the right thing to do because this is a system from which you emerged as a in part lucky winner and you should be in a way engaging back and trying to make sure that the benefits of that go in part for the common good and the last thing i would say is this notion of environmental versus social and specific causes within that very often and it's natural that we specialize in different things but it's important to bear in mind that what we're really trying to do is, is solve an integrated problem. The integrated problem is what uh, Kate Raworth in her book, Donut Economics, has, ha, has called a donut. And the donut is, the outer boundary of the donut is sort of the ecological ceiling of how much the planet, the environmental can handle in terms of stress as we see growth, as we see progress. But the inner circle is the social foundation. So that's the bare minimum that not as a favor, but as a matter of justice, people deserve to get. And we have to make sure that there is a certain level of progress that everybody is entitled to and is able to get access to. And that is equitably spread out. And then our resources and the environmental limits are, are being respected in a way that we really stay within the donor. We, every, Everybody has a minimum standard of living across the world and, and well-being and dignity uh, while you know we are able to keep the environment at a point where things don't go out of hand and, and we are also being just to the future generations that are that are coming after us. Mm -hmm.